It is time for questions uh, to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and we will start with listed questions. Before I call Mr. Patsy McGlone, can I welcome uh, Ms. Michelle McElween uh, to her first question time in her role as Junior Minister? Mr. McElween. Mr. McGlone, sorry. Mr. McGlone, sorry. <laughs> not, as, not as pretty. It might have changed, but not quite yet. <laughs> yeah. so, the um, uh, Kisht Everhain. Well, Deputy Speaker, the first phase of the Executive's childcare strategy was launched in September 2013. This included 15 key first actions designed to address the main childcare needs uh, identified through research and consultation. The greatest area of need identified was for school-aged <laughs> childcare services, breakfast clubs, after-school clubs and summer schemes aimed at the 4 to 14 age group. The school-aged childcare grant scheme, which former Junior Minister Bell and Junior Minister McCann launched in March of 2014, was uh, developed to address this need. It is both creating new, low-cost, quality school-aged childcare places and sustaining the places we already have. To date, the grant scheme has held two calls for applications, which have attracted 119 responses. Of these, 79 met the selection criteria and have been allocated some three million over a three-year period. These projects will sustain or create approximately 2,200 low-cost, quality childcare places, mostly in disadvantaged areas. A third call for applications will be held in the autumn. This will result in further low-cost childcare places being created. Other key first actions have uh, enhanced childcare services for children with a disability and improved the information available to parents on the childcare services available locally. Work to develop the full final childcare strategy is at an advanced stage. It has been developed on a co-designed basis with full engagement with childcare stakeholders. We aim to issue the strategy for consultation in the coming weeks with a view to publishing it before the end of the year. Call Mr. McLone for a supplementary. Uh, I'm afraid you will ask you on call you. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, would, would I ask the Minister, uh, does she accept that childcare costs are one of the most fundamental crippling issues for many working families at the moment? And um, indeed, it's an issue which is facing many, especially young mums, with the opportunity, or rather the not opportunity, the non opportunity, the situation where they're actually having to leave good places of work because it's costing them to pay childcare costs. So it's really a function I would ask that the Minister look deeply at this, especially for working families. I thank the member for those points. And indeed, the twin aims of the childcare strategy uh, are to promote child development, and I think we all want to see that happening, but also to enable parents to join the workforce. I know he's referring to people having to leave the workforce in order to deal uh, with their childcare needs, but certainly the cost, uh, and in many cases the high cost, of childcare has been uh, what the strategy has been trying to identify. It's certainly where the key actions have been focusing on and how you deal with that. Do you deal with it through free childcare places? Do you deal with it through a subsidy route? How, in fact, is the best way to deal with that issue? And those are the sorts of issues uh, that the board has been looking at in relation to the full childcare strategy. And I think uh, that will be the key driver moving forward. Uh, as he will know, uh, social enterprises have been um, identified as a way of dealing with that issues in relation uh, to having uh, low-cost, affordable childcare. Uh, but indeed, there are many uh, small private sector companies providing that as well, and we need to ensure that we don't knock those small private sector companies out of the field uh, by using other mechanisms to deliver the uh, good quality childcare. So it certainly is the focus of uh, where the department is at, and it will very much form part uh, of the basis of the full childcare strategy. I'll call Ms. Brenda Hill. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. And I was just wondering, are, are we examining the potential of ex extending the UK government's plans to increase the hours of free childcare in England and Wales to, to Northern Ireland? Um, I thank the member for her question. And indeed, the detail uh, of the proposals by the Prime Minister are still uh, emerging. They're still uh, being developed, and the department will very much be examining 
uh, those proposals in detail to see if there is merit in having a, a similar initiative here in Northern Ireland. I will say, however, that, uh, and this goes back to the original uh, question, that, that the Department has been cautious in taking a simple subsidy or the top-up approach uh, to childcare here, uh, because the international evidence and indeed the national evidence suggests that the market often adjusts within a few years and that largely subsumes uh, the top-up amounts when in actual fact uh, the price of childcare rises and that's not what we want to see happening. We want to ensure that uh, more children uh, are able to be uh, accommodated in low-cost, quality and accessible uh, childcare for their parents and that's uh, true whether it's in an urban area or indeed whether it's in a rural area. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister why, uh, in a climate of such scarce resources, uh, OFMDFM has failed to use around £8 million pounds of a £12 million pound budget set aside for childcare in 2011 to 2015, and how the proposed UK tax free childcare scheme will apply to Northern Ireland? Well, in relation to his second point, uh, as I said, the details are still emerging uh, in relation to the announcement from the Prime Minister. Uh, we will watch very carefully as to whether uh, there will uh, be a read across to Northern Ireland or whether indeed there are merits that we uh, adopt a similar scheme uh, here uh, in Northern Ireland uh, to what's going to happen in England and Wales. But we must ensure uh, that whatever we do, uh, that it is uh, fit for purpose here in Northern Ireland because, of course, we have a very rural community here in Northern Ireland, not taking away from, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the urban areas, but we do have uh, very specific issues uh, in relation to Northern Ireland with our rural community. Uh, in relation to the uh, money that was ring-fenced to support the development of the childcare strategy, uh, 4.7 million has been allocated and 3.4 million has been spent. The balance will continue uh, to be used to resource the key first actions of the childcare strategy. Uh, I don't think it's correct to say that the fund has been uh, underspent. Uh, we will continue to work through those key first actions and then uh, through the development of the full childcare strategy, and as I've indicated, uh, cost in particular and accessibility uh, will be two of the main issues that we will look at in relation to that full strategy. Call Sandra over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And indeed, that was the Chris's touch on the question that I wanted to touch on. But I'm sure the minister will agree with me that um, the childcare, uh, childcare for our. Uh, to, to increase the, those economically active right across Northern Ireland is, should be uh, a big priority of this assembly, and, uh, and she will assure us of her commitment to that. Uh, absolutely, and um, indeed, parents have uh, themselves identified that cost and accessibility are the principal barriers in relation um, to uh, getting school age, in particular, childcare. Uh, at an appropriate level. There seems to be more availability for children uh, preschool, but once they go to school, there seems to be uh, more of a dearth of places available uh, for childcare, and that's something that we should be concerned about because, of course, we do need to enable parents, uh, whether they're male or female, to be able to enter into uh, the market for work and to be able to move ahead in that regard, if they so choose, because, of course, uh, there are some who will want to remain at home uh, with their children. But absolutely, cost and accessibility are the key issues. I must inform the House that uh, questions 5, 9 and 13 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Barry McElduff. Uh, question number two, Kesh Deverado. Mr Speaker, with our Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Michelle McElveen to answer this question. Thank you. Um, racial equality and good race relations are key aims for this department and the executive. The need for a strategy that not only helps us deliver these key aims, but which also reflects the aspirations and the everyday concerns of people is an ambitious goal, but is one we are determined to get right. Our 16-week public consultation instigated much discussion and elicited many opinions from right across society, academics, trade unions, pressure groups, political parties, individuals, key stakeholders and church groups, amongst others, provided detailed contributions. 
The analysis of those contributions has now been completed and we are now considering a revised draft of the strategy in light of that analysis. The document will be considered by the Executive in due course before publication. Mr. McElduff for uh, Gorham, uh, Thank uh, Junior Minister McElveen for her answer. And can I ask the Junior Minister if she believes that reform of the legislation will be a key feature of the strategy uh, going forward, the racial equality strategy, and how she might envisage such reform of the legislation rolling out? Um, obviously, thank you. Okay. So thank, thank the member for his, for his answer, and indeed, um, reform is, is certainly something which is being um, being looked at. Do you understand that the, the draft strategy is currently with ministers at the moment, um, and that is something that we are currently looking at and hope to have um, uh, published in, in the not, not too distant future. Um, so, I think, obviously, having discussed th these issues with a number of the groups, um, they are concerned that that we do have a strategy which actually works. Um, and, and that's something that we're looking forward to seeing rolled out. Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Uh, I thank the junior minister uh, for answers to date. Could she tell us what is the current rate of intersectional multiple uh, discrimination as defined on page 40 of the consultation document to which she referred earlier? Um, the member's actually been very specific in relation to that, and if he doesn't mind, I can, I'll, I'll write to, them, to him with that answer. Call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I too join in welcoming the Junior Minister to her first question time? Can I ask her, could she outline uh, some detail in relation to the crisis fund? Thank the member for his answer. In the last financial year, the crisis fund provided support to a significant number of minority ethnic individuals in emergency situations who traditionally have fewer and weak, weaker support networks to avoid destitution. The crisis fund has benefited several vulnerable groups, vulnerable migrants, EU and non-EU nationals, destitute refugees and asylum seekers and other identifiable vulnerable groups such as Roma. The Red Cross was the lead administrator of the fund and responsibility for day-to-day -de -day decision um, lies with that organisation. There were 12 partners in total delivering funding from the crisis fund. Officials will shortly be meeting again with Red Cross and others to discuss how the last round of funding went and whether there was scope or need for any improvements. They'll also be considering the reasons why people are falling into crisis and whether there is any action that should be taken to prevent matters getting to crisis point. Call Karen McKeva. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I too um, uh, commend uh, Ms McIlveen on her promotion to uh, Junior Minister and I wish her all the best uh, in her post. Um, but can I ask the Minister, uh, could she confirm that the severe criticism of the draft by organisations like NISIM uh, shall be taken fully on board? Um, I thank the, the Minister, for, uh, thank the Member for her, her answer. And um, yes, absolutely, um, there, have, there have been certainly criticisms by NISIM, um, but um, I know that over over the period of time, um, much of what has been said has been in relation to the delay of the strategy. And having spoken to, to that organisation as well, they're very keen that the strategy is well considered and that it actually does make a difference. Um, the, the draft strategy, which is being referred to, again, is in, is in draft and still um, requires further discussion. Um, so we're hopeful that what is then delivered will be acceptable to all groups. Call Ms Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, again, I, like others, I would like to congratulate the junior minister on her appointment and also welcome her to her first question time. I'm sure the, minister, the junior minister was aware there was a very well-attended meeting last week of, of, uh, by, by um, BMDs, um, expressing really a lot of frustration about the delay of the strategy. And we understood at that meeting that the DFM actually has signed off the finalised draft strategy. It is now sitting uh, with uh, OFM. Can the junior minister confirm when OFM will sign off that strategy and have it published? Okay, 
I thank, thank the member for her question. She's obviously um, better informed than I am in relation to DFM having signed that off. My understanding is that it's still with both ministers and um, will then have to go to executive colleagues for um, their consideration. So it, it's, still, it's still at that stage. And I can't be any more definitive than that, although we would like to see it move down as quickly as possible. Call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Gromega de Freer asking Tori Kesh over three. Question number three. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, uh, I will again ask Junior Minister Michelle McAveen to answer this question. Thank you. The Children's Services Corporation Bill was introduced to the Assembly by Mr Stephen Agnew in December 2014 and passed into second stage in January 2015, following which it was referred to the OFM DFM Committee for scrutiny. Whilst our department is supportive of the general principle of the bill, we do hold concerns regarding the drafting of the current bill. Officials have been working with the sponsor of the bill to address these concerns and consider potential amendments. We have now shared potential amendments with the OFM DFM committee and officials provided an update to the committee on the 17th of June. The committee is scheduled to complete its scrutiny of the bill by the 3rd of July. We do, however, wish to discuss the amendments further, in particular with relevant departments, to ensure the bill is effective, practical and beneficial for our children and young people. Mr Flanagan for supplementary. I thank the, the junior minister for her answer. Um, <clears throat> leaving the, the concerns about the potential wording of the bill, um, does the minister accept the, the the, that there is a need for a statutory duty to cooperate um, across departments in the delivery of children's services. Um, I thank the minister, or the, sorry, the member for his, his questions. And absolutely, um, the overall intention of the bill is positive, um, and any lever that will encourage um, departments and agencies to work closely together in this area of policy will certainly be welcomed. Um, the breadth of um, policies and services relating to young people um, means cooperation is absolutely essential and, and certainly as a member throughout my time um, in this house um, I have been concerned about um, the services for children and young people and ensuring the policy is right in, in ensuring that they have a, a positive future. Call Mr David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too would like to welcome my friend uh, to her role in Junior First Minister. Whilst, to the best of my knowledge, we are not related, it's still very encouraging to see a McIlvain in the front benches, and uh, I always say here, here to that. But just in relation to uh, the point that was made in, 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 her, in her answer so far, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the Junior Minister has mentioned that there were maybe some concerns around the, the current draft. I wonder if I could ask the Junior Minister just to go into a little bit more detail um, around some specific concerns that she might have about the current draft. Thank, thank the member um, for his question. Um, yeah, the bill at this stage is quite general and therefore is uh, at risk that the impact in terms of delivery is actually minimal. Um, there's a danger that the bill could promise much but actually deliver quite little, um, with the main result being that the, the bill really increases bureaucracy um, rather than improving outcomes for children and young people. The term cooperation is not easily defined or easily measured. Uh, the reporting function focuses solely on the cooperation element. And while this is important, we feel that it would be more beneficial if we reported on service delivery and impact on children and young people. Another issue which is of concern is around Clause 4. Um, and this would appear to empower Health and Social Care Board over a range of public bodies, including departments. And this is something, again, which um, could be seen as perhaps inappropriate. In addition, it could be pointed out that departments do already work closely together and given the cross-cutting nature of this policy, much of this work is considered corporately at executive level. Uh, there are a range of cross-departmental groups that operate in this area and there is a regular ongoing engagement with the sector via a number of different bodies. Um, and so while we have those concerns, um, we certainly um, agree with the principle of the bill and we are looking at further amendments. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. I would also uh, congratulate the um, junior minister on her elevation and uh, I would ask her, in fact, 
Does she regret that the Committee for the Office uh, of the First and Deputy First Minister uh, will not have sight of the Department's final recommendations until after the Committee stage of the Bell has ended? Um, thank, the, thank the member for his question, uh, and certainly that it, that it would be something of concern. It would, and it, perhaps it might have been useful at committee stage that perhaps that, that time had been extended further in order to allow that. Um, but I, I guess we are where we are in relation to that at this stage. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker. I too congratulate the new minister. And in her previous role, she'd appreciate that. Special education needs one of the major concerns is the lack of joined up work cooperation between the Department of Education and the Department of Health. To, to, in my, I firmly believe that this Children's Service Cooperation Bill is an essential part of that new SEN Bill. What's her opinion? Um, I thank um, the member for his comments and also for his question, and I tend to, to agree with him in, re in relation to that. And he will understand that I have had um, long concern in relation to cooperation between health and education, um, and sometimes it's very much dependent on individuals in both of those, in both um, either be it in trusts or as they formerly were boards, um, who have worked very positively together in order to have positive outcomes for individual children. But we want to make sure that that's, that's the case right across. Um, Northern Ireland. So um, I would be in agreement with the member in relation to that. I call Mr. George Robinson. Question for you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister are committed and will continue to remain committed to ensuring that victims and survivors receive the best services possible and that funding is targeted to those most in need. To that end, the ministers will take whatever steps necessary to mitigate any impact the delay in agreeing welfare reform has on organisations working with victims and survivors. Funding this financial year has been increased with over £14 million provided to support the victim sector. This includes the highest ever opening budget for victims and survivors service and reflects the continued commitment of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to victims and survivors. The Victims and Survivors Service has already issued letters of offers uh, to victims and survivors groups for this financial year. In addition, the Ministers are continually looking for ways to improve service provision. OFM DFM officials, in collaboration with key stakeholders, including the Victims and Survivors Service, the Commission for Victims and Survivors, are in the process of examining the service delivery model currently providing services to victims and survivors. This collaborative programme of work will help to design and inform the types of services required for victims and survivors going forward. The input from stakeholders gleaned through this collaborative programme, coupled with the valuable feedback from the recent reviews of the Victims and Survivors Service on what is working well and the areas which require further analysis, will provide a useful steer to build on the improvement to services which have occurred in recent months. Mr Robinson, for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. <clears throat> and could the Minister give an, an update on the victim's pension? Well, if the member is referring to the uh, uh, pension uh, for uh, seriously injured uh, people, as he knows, that is a, a commitment uh, in relation to the Stormont House Agreement, and uh, that uh, is something that is moving forward. Officials have been tasked to bring forward a paper on a possible victim's pension uh, for the party leaders' group. Um, that paper will draw on the useful background paper uh, from WAVE. Uh, and the report commissioned uh, by the Commissioner for Victims uh, and Survivors. I know there has been uh, much uh, talk about this issue uh, recently. Uh, will it apply outside Northern Ireland? Uh, will terrorists be able to avail of the pension? Uh, certainly, uh, I took heart from the fact that the Secretary of State seems to be moving to a position where uh, she is going to address the issue of victims residing outside of Northern Ireland who have been directly impacted uh, by the Troubles, and I fundamentally welcome that because it's in uh, line with the Stormont House Agreement at paragraph 26, where it says the needs of victims who do not live in Northern Ireland should also be recognised, and I think that that is something very much to be welcomed. Uh, Gordon, I've got to previously ask, I'm sure the, uh, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Can the Minister say that rather than limit the consideration to the issues of welfare, have the First and Deputy First Minister given any assessment of the impact of Tory austerity cuts on frontline services? Gordon, um, I noted that the Deputy First Minister was uh, in London uh, at the weekend, and we look forward to 
hearing uh, how much money he was able to uh, achieve by attending uh, that particular event. For my part, uh, I went to uh, see the Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, last week, and he made it very, very clear that there is no more money in relation to welfare reforms for Northern Ireland. Uh, and indeed, he, was, he went further to say that welfare reform was an essential part uh, of moving forward. And of course, it's a fundamental part of the Stormont House Agreement. Uh, and without one part of the Stormont House Agreement, the rest of the Stormont House Agreement does not proceed. Call Mr. Trevor Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the, the Minister? If, if we don't agree welfare reform and if it causes the collapse of these institutions, would you still expect the British government to honour the agreements made at the Stormont House during the negotiations on the past, of course? Well, you know, we came to an agreement on the 23rd of December which brought about £2 billion of spending power for Northern Ireland over a number of years. And yet we are going back to the United Kingdom government and saying that's not good enough. We want more money at a time when we're dealing with the deficit. And as part of the United Kingdom, we have to deal with the deficit. And the deficit, the deficit currently is in and around 75, 76 billion pounds. We can't ignore those facts. If we're part of the United Kingdom, which we are, and which we will be uh, under the consent principle until the people of Northern Ireland decide otherwise, then we have to deal with the budget that is allocated to us by the Westminster Government. And wishing it away isn't going to do any good. We have to get real and deal with the issues that are in front of us now. Call Mr. Jim Allister. The Minister told Mr. George Robinson that the proposition of a pension for seriously injured victims was moving forward. Uh, can I ask her, in terms of moving forward, is there a departmental acceptance that such a pension can only be for innocent victims? And if there is not that acceptance, will there be any pension? Well, all I can do, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, is speak on behalf of uh, the First Minister's side of OFM DFM and make it perfectly clear, as we have done right throughout this issue, that we will not support any pension if it is to be accessed by terrorists. That is very clear. I can't be any more clear uh, in relation to that matter. Uh, if uh, it comes, uh, obviously, that it then goes to the very heart of the issue of the definition of a victim. And so we will have to revisit uh, that issue again. As he knows, uh, this party brought forward proposals to try and deal with this issue, but unfortunately, uh, others on uh, the other side of the House did not feel that they could support that. I hope when we bring it forward again that the SDLP in particular will look at the issue and decide to move forward. Call Mr John McAllister. Question number six. The programme for government 2011-15 sets out an ambitious programme to deliver real improvement in people's lives. Since then, despite difficult economic conditions, the quality of life for people has improved. Data from the Office of National Statistics show that people here have greater happiness, satisfaction and sense of purpose and lower anxiety than others in the UK, and these indicators are all improving. Of the 82 commitments in the programme for government, almost 81% has been achieved, well in advance of the 70% achieved in the last programme for government. OFMDFM has led on 14 of these commitments through the Delivering Social Change Framework. For example, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have found uh, innovative new approaches to tackling deep-seated cross-cutting issues. Successes have been notable in areas including numeracy and literacy and support for families and young people. Through the Social Investment Fund, the Ministers have committed £53.7 million to projects to date, 67 per cent of the total fund. Engagement with Europe has increased, exceeding targets by drawing down over 80 million of competitive funds. Under Together Building a United Community, seven major good relations programmes have been put in place. They represent the largest investment in constructive community relations in our history. They are a positive statement of the Minister's ambition in building a better future. When the First Minister and Deputy First Minister set out their programme for government, they never pretended that the achievement of its aims would be straightforward. It was expressly an ambitious programme aimed at transformative change, and their achievements in this period show the benefits of such an approach. 
That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Daphne Mackay. I get a brief ask, uh, Can I ask the minister to tell us what specific uh, benefits are going to be targeted uh, by the Tory government's 12 billion welfare cut being announced today? Well, as the member is fully aware, uh, as is his leadership, this question has been asked on numerous occasions, um, both at Stormont House Agreement meetings and, indeed, I presume, uh, directly to national government ministers. And uh, we are unaware as to what specific reductions have been uh, earmarked. However, he will read the same newspapers as I do, and he will have seen, uh, or maybe not, as the case may be, and he will have seen uh, the predicted areas where the £12 billion uh, will be cut. Mr Mackay for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, her party colleague Sammy Wilson has already uh, noted the fact that he would support uh, cuts to welfare to the budget, which would result in a reduction in our block grant. Can she be clear and can she uh, be unambiguous uh, in stating whether her party does or does not support these cuts? Well, can I, can I say to the member that our party uh, voted against, unlike his party, uh, our party voted against uh, the previous cuts to welfare at Westminster. They, they go, they have a voice at Westminster, unlike uh, the party opposite, who are not there to make the case. Yes, you can go to rallies and make the case, but why not go to the House of Commons to make the case in relation uh, to these matters? And I have to say, uh, if uh, these welfare cuts come as are uh, predicted. Uh, the estimated welfare costs to Northern Ireland of a £12 billion reduction would likely be in excess of £350 million. That's in relation to Barnet. That's the Barnet share uh, for uh, Northern Ireland. So it is uh, a matter uh, of grave concern, it has to be said. Uh, but I have no doubt that our MPs will raise their voices at Westminster and they will be heard at Westminster in relation to the very deep concerns that we will have in relation to those issues. Mr David McNary. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I congratulate the Junior Minister, McElveen, on their handling of questions today? And then could I ask the Minister, if a working budget linked to the Stormont House Agreement is not secured, what recommendations will the First and Deputy First Ministers bring to this House? Well, as the member knows, and uh, I, I think he was here when I uh, spoke in relation to the budget last week, this budget is predicated on the full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement, and that includes welfare reform implementation. So, therefore, uh, that matter will have to be dealt with, and it will have to be dealt with sooner rather than later. McNary for supplementary. Taking that matter further, then, can I ask at what stage will the First Minister move for the dissolution of this Assembly, or are we to sit here in limbo until 2016 May? I can assure the member that he will not be sitting in limbo in May 2016. Call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. In the last number of years, the Executive has certainly punched above its weight um, in being successful in attracting FDI to Northern Ireland. Is the Minister concerned that the current political impasse that, that is currently um, existing could damage the ability to attract, to attract further investment? I thank the member for his question. And there is no doubt uh, that one of our strongest selling points when we uh, do go to uh, sell Northern Ireland as a destination for investment, a destination to bring jobs to. It is in and around uh, political stability. And I do say to those who are putting the political stability of Northern Ireland at risk that they should think long and hard about that, because we have had tremendous success in relation to job creation. Uh, the programme for government target in relation to job creation uh, was 25,000. We brought 36,000 uh, jobs to Northern Ireland, and we should be incredibly proud of that. But we were able to do that because we had political stability here in Northern Ireland. Mr. McRae, for supplementary. Is the minister therefore concerned that the delay in giving or deciding upon a date 
and a rate for corporation tax uh, will have a negative impact on our ability to bring more jobs to Northern Ireland? Well, as the member uh, is aware, um, the devolution of corporation tax was something which this whole House, uh, apart from one or two uh, notable exceptions, uh, agreed upon. And indeed, the Westminster government uh, has stepped up to the plate in relation to that. They have fulfilled the Stormont House Agreement uh, position. Uh, they have brought forward legislation. It received royal assent, I think, on the 17th of March. And now it, it is a matter for us. Do we want to have this uh, transformative tool in our box in relation to uh, growing the economy in Northern Ireland, or do we not? And the reality is that if we decide to go ahead uh, with the devolution of corporation tax and to lower that rate, the full amount in relation to the cost of the block grant does not come until three years after it is uh, brought into, uh, in, into the position. So if we were to bring it in for April 2017, uh, which is probably not going to be the case now, uh, because time has gone, uh, then the full cost of the block would not have happened until 2020-2021. So it's wrong to mix the cost of corporation tax up with welfare reform costs, because at that stage, uh, the Office uh, of Budget Responsibility has indicated that revenue uh, will be more readily available at that time and we will start coming out of a deficit position. So there will be more money available in 2020-2021 to deal with those issues. So uh, I think we need to have clarity uh, on a lot of these issues, but it is wrong to mix up the cost of corporation tax and the cost of welfare reform. Call Mr Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I know the Minister has already touched on this, but could the Minister indicate whether she believes the resolution of welfare reform is critical to the full, full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement? I absolutely do. Um, the implementation of welfare reform is critical uh, to the implementation. It unlocks all of the other issues that were agreed during the Stormont House Agreement. And the Stormont House Agreement was a comprehensive, uh, a balanced agreement, which had parts in it uh, that uh, individually each party may not have recommended, but it was uh, a compromise agreement that was to move forward Northern Ireland. And because of the non-implementation of welfare reform, we find ourselves back as if the Stormont House Agreement had not been agreed. Uh, and what does that say to the wider world, that we come to an agreement and then we cannot deliver on that agreement? Uh, so it's very important that we move forward in relation to welfare reform so that we can move forward on all of the issues identified in the Stormont House Agreement. Mr Spratt for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister uh, for her answer so far. Can I ask the Minister, has the Deputy First Minister indicated whether, as a result of his attendance at the uh, anti-austerity rally in London at the weekend, whether there has been any indication that the Executive uh, will receive any additional funding? Well, no, there has been no uh, indication to me or indeed to the Office of First Minister in relation to that matter. And uh, the only way that we can move forward uh, in relation to these issues is to get on, agree uh, welfare reform, which I have to say in relation to Northern Ireland, we are going to have the most generous welfare package of any part of the United Kingdom and indeed any part of these islands, I would say. Uh, so it is time to move ahead and to get the matter dealt with so that we can move ahead and deal with growing the economy here in Northern Ireland. Call the Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in light of the tragic uh, events surrounding the death of young Ronan Hughes, what steps the Department can take to assist with online safety? Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McElveen to answer that question. Thank you, and indeed um, the death of Ronan Hughes was indeed tragic, and I would like to extend my deepest sympathy to his parents, Jared and Teresa Hughes, um, his wider family, and indeed um, his friends and pupils at um, St Joseph's Grammar School in Donockmore. In terms of actions um, which are being taken forward by the Executive to address internet safety issues, the Executive agreed at its meeting on the 29th of January to formally commission the Safeguarding Board to develop an e-safety strategy and an action plan. Um, SBNI have appointed a project manager um, to work within an 18-month time frame, and they aim to draft the e-strategy 
e-safety strategy um, within that period. Um, this will then be um, presented to the executive. Now, while OFMD FM doesn't directly um, have involvement in internet safety strategy, um, just in our roles as, as junior ministers, myself and junior minister McCann have central responsibility um, for matters relating to children and young people. Um, and we have been involved in a, a number of, of actions associated with that, participating in meetings um, such as the Ministerial Coordination Group on Suicide Prevention and, and Internet Safety. Um, um, is, and this is being considered at that group. Um, looking to the future, I will continue to pursue opportunities to promote um, safety awareness and officials will also be liaising um, with the UK Safer Internet Centre on developments in the pipeline. Um, this will also include, for example, the launch by the centre of a new programme in September for secondary schools, um, and this is called Child, Child Net Digital Leaders Programme, and this will offer schools across um, the UK access to online training and support for pupils. Lord Morrow for supplement. Well, I thank the junior minister for her very comprehensive answer, and I too wish her well in her new post. Uh, but I'm sure the junior minister would agree with me that promoting safer use of the internet is very important. Has there been a date set for a day to uh, promote a safer internet? I thank the, um, the member for his question. Um, there, there is an annual event, um, Safer Internet Day, and the next one is scheduled for the 9th of February 2016. Um, this will obviously represent a further opportunity for us to promote um, internet, sa internet safety messages. Well, Mr. Barry McElduff. Can I ask Minister Foster for her assessment of the work carried out by support groups for ethnic minority members of our community? Well, of course, uh, like many other support groups uh, across Northern Ireland, the support groups that exist to support the ethnic minority are a, a critical part of the infrastructure, the ecosystem, as it were, to help those who are from an ethnic minority background. And so I very much, uh, and I know the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister, very much values uh, the work that goes on by a number of those groups. For supplement. Okay. Uh, can I ask the Minister if she might consider uh, supporting the notion of funding being made available to ethnic community support groups like the OMA Ethnic Community Support Group on a multi-annual basis so that they can prepare for the longer term, not just on a year-to-year -year basis? And just to join with other members in welcoming Junior Minister McElveen in her role today. Well, can I say to, to the member, there will be a number of bids made uh, in relation to a number of sectors and a number of groups. All those bids need to be seen in the context of where we are uh, with the budget, uh, with the non-agreement of welfare reform, uh, because if we don't have welfare of reform agreement, then we have a £600 million hole uh, in the budget. Therefore, the budget that is in front of this House at present, and will come to the floor again this afternoon, is predicated on welfare reform. So I do hope that he and others will join with me in saying that we need to deal with welfare reform, and then we can get around to dealing with groups from OMA and everywhere else. Mr Edwin Poots is not in his place. Mr Cathal Boyland is not in his place. I therefore call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the, the Minister how close are we as an Assembly and an Executive on bringing forward a rural proofing bill? Well, I do know that the Minister of Agriculture has a paper uh, in front of the Executive in relation to statutory rural proofing, and uh, I understand that uh, that is coming before the Executive in the very near future. Mr McQuillan for supplement. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? And just would she agree with me that almost 35 per cent of people live in the rural areas of Northern Ireland and would very much welcome this rural proofing bill? I wonder if that's something that she would agree with. Well, I will say that I very much welcome uh, the acknowledgement of those of us who live in the rural areas and the needs that we have in the rural areas. It may not necessarily be the same uh, for those who live in urban areas, and there is always uh, a need to realise that, to identify those issues, and to deal with those issues in the most appropriate way. Time is up. We must now move.